I just also want to acknowledge, again, Jennifer Boylan and Moms Demand Action and Every Town and all of the advocates because none of this progress would be made in Washington but for the powerful voices of people all across America that are demanding uh, action by the Congress of the United States. And I particularly want to acknowledge the young people who have been such an important part of this movement, uh, demanding that we create environments for them to grow and learn and be successful free of gun violence. So thank you. Uh, I'm happy to take a few questions if anyone has. The hard ones I'll give to you, Attorney General. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'll how we can assess the chances. I mean, it's not obvious, but I mean, expect this will pass in the House. It passed the House. Both bills passed the House. Right. Uh, they are now in the Senate. Uh, sh uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said he will bring them to the floor for a vote. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, these are overwhelmingly popular. Not over 90% of the American people support both of these common sense proposals, including 85% of gun owning households. So, this is not a controversial issue any place but in the Republican caucus where it continues to be a challenge. Uh, but I do think that the prospect of passage in the Senate is very strong because I think things are different now. We have a president who will sign these bills into law. We have democratic control of the Senate. And um, the American people have made it very clear that they expect Congress to take action to reduce gun violence in this country. Why do you suppose it's a challenge in the Republican caucus? I think it's in part because of the power and influence of the gun lobby in this country that spend enormous amounts of money. Uh, and whose single interest is the sale of guns. Uh, they are, the gun, the gun lobby is essentially gun manufacturers who just want to sell as many guns as possible. Uh, and I think uh, they exercise, an, uh, sort of, they, they've sort of exercised a disproportionate influence over the Republican Party. And uh, because it's, this is supported by the constituents that the members of the United States Senate represent, um, but the, the gun lobby is very powerful and spends lots of money to help people get elected. So has a lot of influence over my Republican colleagues. Gun manufacturers seem to do well when Democrats come into office. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. They, 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 I remember when President Obama was first elected, there was an active campaign encouraging people to go out and buy guns because President Obama was going to come and take your guns, which of course was not true. But it produced huge profits for gun manufacturers, so it works to their advantage to make those claims. So last year was a banner year for gun sales because of COVID and civil unrest, a lot of things, and including in January during the insurrection. Um, wow. So is there also been a corresponding rise in gun violence either in Rhode Island? Um, I don't you know the best, yeah. but probably the Attorney General fans. I mean, I think yeah. the answer is yes, but I don't have the, st the actual statistics of the time. Yeah. Definitely yes. Definitely yes. I mean, I think anecdotally, I know that I don't know that the numbers. But legal or illegal guns on the street? I'm sorry? Legal or illegal gun purchases, the increased violence in the community. Well, well, the problem is when, it's, when people don't have to have a background check, I, I think the number that they've used is every single day, background checks stop more than 160 felons and 50 domestic abusers from getting a gun from a federal license gun deal. The problem is in most states they can just then go online or to a, another source and not have a background check, those very same people. So it's, it's sometimes hard to distinguish because it's, if you, it's easy for people to avoid a background check by purchasing something at a gun show or online, a place where a background check is not conducted, then no background check is done and you have no confidence that the person who's purchasing it is not a prohibited buyer. So this is why, as the Attorney General said, these are very common sense. Everyone agrees dangerous people, criminals, people who are prohibited under federal law from getting guns should not be able to get one. And we know that this is a successful model because more than three million such people have been denied the right to buy a gun when they went into a gun deal. The problem is more than one in five gun sales happen without this kind of background check. And these two pieces of legislation just make sure that that doesn't happen anymore in this country. We have pretty good common sense gun control laws here in the state. Will changing federal laws such as this impact people in Rhode Island, whether it's gun owners now or those who want to buy guns? We do have good gun laws here in Rhode Island, and congratulations to everyone who's worked on that and made it happen. Uh, the reality is, though, unless you have this as a national policy, someone who you know, comes from a state that doesn't have the same quality of gun laws can go to that state, do it, and then bring the gun into Rhode Island. So really, although it's valuable Rhode Island to have the good gun laws that we have, part of the solution has to be that they have to be applied across the country, and that's why national gun laws are so important. Yeah, particularly if I can with the delayed denials. I mean, that's a, that's a critical problem. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you.
it's not easier by any means. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we have a private sale law here in Rhode Island, but the Congressman's absolutely right. That needs to apply everywhere because if there are private sales going on around the country without background checks, we, we know that guns travel. We've brought cases when I was a U.S. attorney. There are cases now in the office where guns are going, traveling over state lines. So we certainly need a national private sale background check policy. The delay. The delayed denials problem exists in Rhode Island because that's a federal issue. If, if the gun check, uh, even with seven days, if the, if the background check isn't done, you get the gun. So you go and you apply to get a gun, the check is sent off to the FBI to get the background check done. If it's not done within a week, and that happens, it happened to the tune of 6,000 times in 2017, it happened 4,000 times in 2016. When that's happening, what that means is the person who ultimately we learn shouldn't get the gun, gets the gun, and then ATF has to mobilize to go out and get the gun back. That's assuming that they can find the person, that the person still has the gun, and that assumes that when they ask for the gun back, the person willingly gives it back. There's no reason to be there. Under this legislation, it's a 10-day period, which is a little bit longer, obviously, gives the FBI more time to do that background check and avoids, or should avoid, if not all, the vast majority of these delayed denials. That delayed denial is something that flies under the radar. It happens right here in Rhode Island. We used to have them when I was a U.S. attorney, where ATF would have to go out and track a gun down from somebody who shouldn't have it. That is an absurd result, and this, is, to me, is an obvious fix and why it's so important. Can we charge it for the person who purchased the gun that way? Any criminal charges? They have uh, a loan, they, they got approved, well, they got yeah. legally. Well, because when you fill out the ATF form, which is ATF form 4473, you have to attest that everything on that on that document is true. So if you fail your background check, then you you have to attest all the things that prevent you from getting a gun. So you know the defense is always, well, I didn't know. Our job in those cases is to prove that the person did know. Where we can't prove it, we brought those cases. And, and just to give context to that. The vast majority of gun sales, 97%, in fact, of background checks are processed within three days. So the vast majority of cases, this is not an issue. The problem is that 3% is a big number when you think about the number of gun sales nationally. And over, between 2008 and 2017, over 35,000 guns were transferred to purchasers who were disqualified from receiving those guns. So they had some criminal record or some other disqualified. So 35,000 guns in the hands of people who were prohibited by federal law from having them. That's a problem. And that's exactly what this legislation would prevent from happening uh, going forward. One more question. If I were a private seller wanting to sell a gun to another person, but I don't do that as a regular job, how easy was it to get a background check and to approach the FBI about doing that? Very easy. Yeah. Your local police department can do it. Um, and uh, there are some exemptions in the law for transfers within families and things. So a father gives his son or daughter a gun, or mother gives her son a gun. Uh, so they are, you know, try to carve out some exemptions. But in general, it would require gun sales, gun transfers, to uh, require a background check. And again, when you consider the potential danger that comes from a firearm and the fact that we've already established a framework for saying that there are certain people who are not allowed to have these as a matter of law, Making sure that that's applied to all gun sales seems to make perfect sense. Huh. Thank you all. Thank you again to our Attorney General and to our other guests for being with us.